our story starts with Rodinia, a supercontinent that formed over a billion years ago, way before Pangaea. These ancient continents were mostly made out of granite and other rocks that are collectively known as basement rock. These rocks are the sturdy base layer that all other rocks were deposited on, kind of like the concrete slab foundation that gets laid down before building a house. So back to Rodinia. Ancient plumes of magma may have fueled the plate tectonic processes that broke up Rodinia, and in doing so, an allocogen was formed in the Oklahoma area. An allocogen is also known as the failed arm in a triple junction. Now as the other continents started to break apart to form an ocean, the failed arm was left behind here in Oklahoma, forming huge basins like the Ardmore Basin. The crust at the bottom of this basin was stretched so much that it allowed magma to creep in and fill in the basin with rhyolite. Sometime after the rhyolite flowed out, ancient seas flowed into the area and filled the basin with marine sediments. The weight of these sediments caused the basin to sink deeper, allowing even more sediments to fill in. In total, this basin was filled with eight vertical miles of sediment, close to two times the height of Mount Everest. After a few hundred million years, the tectonic plates came together again to form a new supercontinent, Pangaea. When the plates crashed into each other, they compressed the basin sediments up against the uplifted basement rock until they formed super tall mountains. A way to think about this would be to imagine a rug being pushed up against a wall. The basement rock is denser than the basin fill, and therefore the basement rock acted like a wall, which the rug was pushed up against. Over hundreds of millions of years later, the mountains were eroded down to the hills we see today. Now we're going to head north on I-35 from Arlington, Texas to see what's left of the Arbuckle Mountains. We'll be crossing over the Red River and into Oklahoma, and past Windstar Resort, the world's largest casino. As geologists, we commonly use rocks exposed on the Earth's surface to tell us the story of what's hidden beneath the Earth. In some places, we see that rocks are covered with a layer of soil and vegetation, not fully allowing us to see what's hidden below the surface. The silver lining to having these roads built throughout the country is that we're able to see what's going on in these rocks below the Earth's surface. Fun fact, the United States interstate numbering system was developed in the 1940s. All north-south interstates are labeled with odd numbers, and all east-west interstates are labeled with even numbers. We are currently on Interstate 35. OK, back to Dan. Highway engineers were able to put dynamite down and explode the rock out to make way for these highways and interstates that transverse over the entire country and allowing geologists to look at the rock structures that give us an idea of what's going on below the earth. Sometimes we're not able to get all the information we need from the rocks in the field. So we take drill core samples of rocks that we take back to the lab to let us know exactly how old these rocks are. Unfortunately, when doing roadside geology, we have a lot of cars driving by. And no matter how loud I tried to scream, it's difficult to get the message across. So a lot of the information that we're going to be covering will be voiced over. Hope that's okay. So we are standing here in front of the geologic structure that formed over 300 million years ago when the supercontinent Pangaea was formed. This is what rocks look like when they are compressed by tectonic forces. When the plates crashed into each other, the compressional forces were so intense that the rocks had nowhere to go but up. Similar to what we see in the Himalayas, where the mountains are still rising 6.1 centimeters each year. The rocks that are seen here are a part of the Arbuckle orogeny. These rocks were originally deposited horizontally on the ocean floor. However, due to the collision of the continents, the flat carbonate rocks that we see here were deformed and folded into a geologic structure known as an anticline. This anticline is only a small local piece of a much larger regional scaled anticline known as the Arbuckle anticline. As soon as the rocks from the Arbuckle orogeny were pushed up into the mountains, they were subjected to chemical and physical weather. The best way to visualize the erosion that occurred here is by following specific rock units like the massive blocky limestone at the top across the structure. By projecting this limestone layer over the top, it is possible to see what the original anticline structure looked like before it was eroded. Similar to how we discussed that rock layers can be projected vertically, 
We can also project layers horizontally thanks to the principle of lateral continuity, which states that rock sediments initially extend laterally in all directions where they are deposited. As we described earlier, the anticline structure has two sides, called limbs, and their angles can be measured using the Brunton compass, one of the oldest tools in geology. This tool has a built-in inclinometer, which uses an air bubble to measure angles, similar to the levels used to hang up picture frames. Measuring the strike and dip of rocks in the field allows geologists to understand the structural history and to link specific rock units between different locations. For this anticline, the south limb dips about 50 degrees and the north limb dips about 30 degrees. Another tool geologists use in the field is hydrochloric acid, otherwise known as HCl. HCl causes a chemical reaction when dropped on limestone, allowing us to accurately identify limestone and other calcium-rich rocks in the field. The chemical reaction releases CO2, kind of like a can of soda when it is first cracked. Now we are going to drive to the heart of the Arbuckles where we find Honey Creek, which flows into a 77-foot cascading waterfall known as Turner Falls. This natural swimming hole has been attracting visitors to the area since 1868. At the last stop, we looked at a large anticline which was formed by compression from plate movement. The compression moved from the south which is why the southern portion of the anticline dips steeper. The northern portion dips roughly around 30 degrees. So we're right here at Turner Falls, which is several miles north of the anticline that we were just at. And geologists typically use dip as a way to confirm that the rocks that we're looking at were deformed by the same events and are the same units of rocks over large distances. So where we are right now, the dip for these rocks is approximately 32 degrees. And by additionally using hydrochloric acid, we can check to see if these rocks are in fact limestone. And we have confirmation. So by using tools like these in the field, it's possible to link large regional events over continental scale distances and uh, what else do I need to say? We hope you learned something about the geologic history of Oklahoma's hidden mountains. Next time you're on the road, take a look at the rock that has been blasted around you. Goodbye friends.